It's a very nice floating pyramid of Doom Games Workshop, but why did you have to make it a Lord of War choice? Hello and welcome back to War Specs Tactics, the strategy-focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. In today's video we're continuing our Necron datasheet review series and we're going over the monolith. It's another iconic and ancient Necron plastic kit reimagined with less green plastic, and in this video we'll be taking a look over its datasheet, any obvious rules, combos and synergies, and some thoughts and discussion about using it in-game. I think this is one of the reworked kits they've really done quite well with. They've managed to keep that same silhouette and feel, maybe make it a bit chunkier and more dangerous looking, and I quite like the fun level feel that you can get with that Necron warrior half materialising out of the portal. In the background, Necron monoliths are their primary planetary assault crafts. Ponderous floating fortresses that drift across the battlefield, beams of crackling energy emerging from them to strike down the interlopers. Monoliths are famously resilient to enemy return fire as well, their living metal skin allowing them to take horrendous punishment and slowly regrow their metal back into shape, sealing breaches and plugging damage. The true threat of a monolith can often be the legions of warriors that it can unleash on the enemy at short notice, however. Its eternity gate will directly link to the tomb world, and even a single monolith touching down on a planet's surface could allow an entire legion of Necron warriors to march through its gate onto the planet, given enough time. As such, when combating Necrons in the field, bringing maximal firepower to bear on the monoliths is of utmost urgency. Let's see what these floating portals of doom can do on the battlefield then. So in the new 9th edition Codex Necrons, monoliths are 19 power level or 360 points. For that you get a monolith armed with its particle whip, 4 gas flux arcs, and an eternity gate, though you can choose to swap out those flux arcs for death rays at 5 points each. Unfortunately, the monolith is now a Lord of War choice, not a heavy support as it was in the previous Codex Necrons, something I did suspect might be happening when we saw that its wounds had gone up to 24. The main reason that this is quite problematic is the detachment rules for 9th edition. It means that if you want to field a single monolith in your army, on top of its points cost, you're essentially paying 3 command points as well. If you want to field 3 of them, then you'll take a super heavy detachment, and that will cost you 6 command points, essentially 2 per monolith. When you're weighing it up against other units, it does mean that you have to bear this in mind, as there is an opportunity cost to taking the monolith that most options don't have. For your investment though, you do get a pretty hefty profile. It's movement 8 inches, weapon skill 6, ballistic skill 3 plus, strength and toughness 8, 24 wounds, 6 attacks, leadership 10 and a 2 plus save. So not incredibly fast, but absolutely built to survive enemy hits. A 2 plus armor save really will keep that thing sticking around for a long time. It degrades at the normal break points at half and a quarter wounds left, and its ballistic skill, movement and attacks characteristics all get progressively worse. In terms of war gear, it's armed with 4 gas flux arcs, which are rapid fire 3 weapons, 30 inch range, strength 5, AP minus 2 and damage 1, and these will actually put out a pretty hefty amount of anti-infantry shooting when up close. If you can get within 15 inch range of the enemy, then your 24 shots will average around about 10 dead orcs or guardsmen per turn, and still have pretty reasonable effectiveness against space marines, seeing as they have fairly decent AP. If you do upgrade to the death rays, which will be 20 points for the 4, each of these is a heavy 1 24 inch range shot, with strength 9, AP minus 3, and a big damage of D3 plus 3. If you focus fire with all of them, then their average expected damage output per turn will be around about 7 wounds on a toughness 7 or 8 vehicle. Of course that number will be very very swingy indeed, depending on just how many of these very powerful wounds that you get through. Its particle whip, the big ball of energy that it has at the top, got really quite significantly upgraded from the previous version. The previous version was only 24 inch range, this one's 36 inches, heavy d6 shots, a big strength 12, AP minus 3, and a flat damage of 3. It also has the blast keyword, which will help it out a bit if you're firing against some decent sized hordes. This one will average around about 4 wounds per turn on a vehicle, obviously in multiples of 3, and flat damage 3 weapons could be pretty useful at the moment to help deal with Gravis armor space marines. Finally, the Portal of Exile special rule in close combat has been significantly reworked. The Portal of Exile has now turned into a close combat weapon, interestingly enough, that auto hits the targets. At full profile, the monolith has a mighty 6 attacks, which will translate to 6 auto hits at a strength 8, AP minus 3, and a flat damage of 3. On average, that will give you around about 10 wounds on a standard toughness 7 vehicle. Sorry, not 13, I think I messed up on the slide there. But nevertheless, that's really quite powerful, as it's pretty much comparable to its range damage output, even if you arm it with the death rays. Interesting that when against heavy units, the monolith is very nearly as good in close combat as it is at range. I would bear in mind though that this combat damage output will degrade significantly as it takes damage, as after your 12 wounds or lower, you'll only have d6 attacks rather than the flat 6. 
It is quite nice though that it means that the enemy is really not going to want to tag your monolith and just try and tie it up that way all that often, as they'll have quite a lot of their troops sucked through the monolith portal, presumably never to be seen again. In terms of special rules, we'll start with keywords. It has the vehicle and titanic keywords, titanic actually being a bit of a downside as it means that you are targetable over obscuring terrain, though you won't be able to see over it yourself. It's also lost the fly keyword that it had on its previous datasheet, which can potentially be a bit of a problem when trying to negotiate round terrain, particularly on the slightly more terrain-dense boards that Games Workshop recommends for 9th. In terms of its main special rules, it of course has living metal to allow it to heal a wound per turn. It has command protocols, which some of the options are fairly decent and we'll get onto in a second. It has the explode special rule for d6 mortal wounds at 6 inches around it, so it has the potential to go up with a very big bang if it goes down. And it has the hovering special rule, meaning that you measure to the hole or the base, whichever is closer. This could potentially be good for charges, as it means that you could get in engagement range pretty easily with units right up high in very tall buildings. It has a built-in deep striking mechanic called Death Descending, which is basically the standard reserves rule. You come in 9 inches away, you don't have to be outside 12 inches as the previous incarnation did. Could be pretty surprising for the opponent to have such a massive unit pop up quite so close to their army. And of course it can bring your legions of necrons in from the tomb world, which is done via its Eternity Gate special rule. Unfortunately to do this you do need to be stationary, which is a bit restrictive. It would have been a lot more helpful if the monolith could have moved beforehand. But this rule basically applies to any core unit of Dynasty Infantry that you've placed in strategic reserve before the game begins. If you have done this with them and the monolith has remained stationary, then when you bring in your reinforcements, you can set them up anywhere within 3 inches of the monolith and not within engagement range of enemy models. This does have the potential to be really quite powerful if the enemy is getting too close to your monolith and you're able to keep it stationary for a turn. You could potentially have some Necrons jump out of it and then make a very very short charge, basically guaranteeing them getting into close combat. Potentially could be good with something like Lich Guard, but remember it would require the command points up front to put the squad in strategic reserve before the game begins. Finally, I didn't mention it earlier, but if you want that the Monolith can fall back and shoot due to its Titanic keyword, which can make it a bit of a pain to deal with for your opponent, as it means they'll often be falling back from you, seeing as there's not all that much advantage in staying in tied up with it to be hit by the Eternity Gate and then still shot by all of its guns. As an Ekron player, I think this makes it quite useful for bullying units with the Monolith. You can happily throw it into combat with things just to tie them up, knowing that you have the choice of either staying there next turn or falling back and still shooting. So let's talk about some of the buffs and synergies that are available to the monolith. First of all, you have the option of Dynastic Codes, likely to be the same one as your main detachment if you want to keep your command protocols. A few of these do look pretty handy for the monoliths. Mephrit aren't too bad at all at range, particularly with those Gauss Flux Arcs, giving them a little bit of extra range and a bit more AP when rapid firing, making them really quite dangerous against heavily armoured targets such as Space Marines. Now that could be quite good fun, just literally to have obsec monoliths, again a big unit that's going to bully enemy units off objectives. Could be very frustrating if you can get it onto midfield objectives. And the Saracen one's always good for a bit of wound re-rolling, plus a feel no pain save never hurts against mortal wounds. Some of the custom dynastic codes are really quite interesting as well, again you can give it objective secures. And the expansionist dynastic code allows you to do a pre-game move with the monolith, zooming it 6 inches towards the enemy before you even start. Could be pretty handy for getting death rays or flux arcs in rapid fire range and also getting charges off. If nothing else though, you could just use the reroll one wound roll per unit, which would be pretty decent on death rays or the portal of exile. Most of the command protocols don't do tons and tons for vehicles, but if it's damaged then the one for living metal can be quite useful. Regenerating an additional wound never hurts. A bit of extra AP on those flux arcs when you wound on sixes could be handy, but potentially the most powerful one could be the one to give it light cover at range. If you put it on turn 1 and the opponent gets first turn, then you could have a 2 plus save with a plus 1 for light cover, which will be very nice indeed. In terms of characters and support units, Technomancers with Canoptic Cloaks can repair vehicles, or Tomb Spiders can. You would have the potential to give it a 5 plus invul save from the Chronomancer, though honestly I'm not sure how worth it it is compared with other units. It already does have a 2 plus save, so a 5 plus invul would only ever come into effect if your opponent shooting you with AP minus 4 weapons. Finally, for a little bit of damage output increase, you could use the Triarch Stalker and his ability to give you reroll wands on any unit that he shoots at. Only a few stratagems can affect the monolith as a Necron Titanic vehicle. I'd say one of the more potentially useful ones is Dimensional Corridor. This is one command point to redeploy a core Necron infantry unit within 3 inches of the monolith, though it does have to be greater than 9 inches away from enemy models. 
Could be pretty useful for getting a Necron unit out of close combat that didn't want to be there, and maybe just allow them to fire again that turn anyway, seeing as they haven't technically fallen back by using this. Stellar Alignment Protocol costs 2 command points on the Monolith, and would allow it to fight on top bracket for a turn. I think it could be 2 command points well spent if you're in a position to do quite a bit of damage. It particularly makes the Monolith far more scary in close combat, compared with if it's only got a few wounds left, and is only attacking with a mere D3 attacks. Next we have Curse of the Phaeron, which costs 3 command points. Though I think they could be 3 command points well spent in the right circumstances, as this can make the Monolith auto-explode. The Monolith has a 6 inch explosion range of D6 mortal wounds apiece. So if you have just rammed a monolith straight down the enemy's throat, they've got fighty infantry and character units swarming all over it when it goes down, then this could tear a huge chunk out of their army all in one go. Whenever the monolith goes down, I would think about whether or not it's worth using this. In most circumstances, probably not. But if you've got a few decent enemy units nearby, then it could be a very, very easy way of dealing tons of damage. Finally, for one command point, we've got Prismatic Dimensional Breach. This allows you to bring in another Necron Core infantry unit in the same way that the Eternity Gate rule works. For me, I don't think that this one's all that strong, to be honest. You already have to pay a command point to put the unit in strategic reserve in the first place, and I'm really not sure how much value you're going to get out of jumping two units out of the monolith in one turn, rather than just one. Out of the various buffs of the monolith, I think some opportunistic repairs seem pretty good to me, and I certainly remember the stratagem as Dimensional Corridor, Stellar Alignment Protocol, and Curse of the Phaeron. So here's a few thoughts about using the monolith in-game. First of all, you have the option of trying to put a unit in strategic reserve, with the express aim of using that portal to bring them in. For me, there's positives and negatives to this. It is quite a powerful deployment option, and they could always come in from a standard strategic reserve otherwise. But if you are going down that strategy, it does mean if you lose your monolith, you also lose the decent way of deploying that unit, the reason that you might have put them in strategic reserve in the first place. Honestly, I think it's an interesting option, though it isn't enormously strong. I think I would certainly consider it, though, if I was running multiple monoliths as then you've got a whole host of different options for where that unit could jump out onto the board, and a lot more chance of surprising an unwary opponent, maybe with a short-range Lich Guard charge. You then have the decision whether or not you want to start the monolith on the board or in the sky. For me, I would typically advise starting on the board, as it's quite a lot of points and damage dealing potential to be having turns wasted with it, and I think generally you're going to want the monolith to be just pushing its way towards the centre of the table, which you can do pretty much as easily just starting on the board as jumping in from Deep Strike. It does have a pretty enormous footprint as well, so if you are reserving it, you might have limited deployment options if your opponent manages to screen well. Maybe if you did want to have a go with it, it's probably best to do it against more elite armies. I'm not sure if it's necessarily the most clever tactical manoeuvre ever, but a monolith appearing from absolutely nowhere to hose the enemy with torrents of fire and then trying to make a charge with that portal of exile seems like at very least it would be fun. If you are starting him on the board, then I'd consider carefully about where he's going to be able to move throughout the game. He doesn't have fly, and if terrain pieces are fairly close together, then he might not actually be able to fit between some of them. You do need to think about where he's going to actually be able to move through. He also ideally wants to have good line of sight, as most things are going to be able to see him as he goes over obscuring terrain, but he might not be able to see other units all that well. In the shooting phase, I typically fire the monolith fairly early, he's got big swingy damage dealing weapons, and I think it's usually a good idea to give them the maximum opportunity to do a lot of damage firing things like particle whips and death rays at hard targets that haven't lost too many wounds. It's quite nice to at least give them the chance to roll very high and to kill a hard target outright. Because he can fall back and shoot for no penalty, and he's got decent melee, I would use the monolith as a sort of bully unit. If there's anything that he can charge at in the fight phase that he's not really going to care too much about the damage dealing output of, throwing him in and using a whole load of portal of exile attacks, and then forcing the opponent to either fall back or remain in combat being ground down. Finally, if the monolith is on its last legs, i certainly consider that top bracket stratagem, have a turn of maximal damage dealing, charge something scary, ideally do a bit more damage to it before getting blown up yourself, and then using the auto-explode stratagem to throw mortal wounds over all over the rest of the enemy. It could be particularly powerful that way, as you could choose where the monolith would end up at the end of the charge, meaning that you could organise it for absolutely maximum impact. Very command point intensive but I've used that sort of manoeuvre with Imperial Knights before, and it really does have the potential to swing a whole game. In terms of comparisons and competitor units to the Monolith, I think in general to justify it competitively, you will have to make use of both its firepower and its bullying melee threat, otherwise you're probably likely better off with Doomsday Arc or Doomstalkers, if you do just want to rain a whole load of anti-tank and gauss fire down on the enemy. Compared with the other Lords of War, I think that the Monolith is in a better place than the Obelisk at the moment, the obelisk is a little bit tougher, though its damage dealing seems far worse to me, and it seems at least reasonably well balanced against the Tesseract Vault, 
the Vault having a few more wounds and also an inball save but being a bit less tough. And of course you'll trade out the Particle Whip and Particle of Exile for a whole load of random wounds being thrown around by those powers of the Catan. My instincts are that the Monolith might be a bit stronger just due to costing so many fewer points but I guess we'll have to wait and see if any of them see play. So let me know what you think of the Necron Doom Pyramid. Is it going to be worth including it despite the command point cost, or is it going to be remain on the shelves in 9th edition, which would be a shame for such a nice model? If you've enjoyed the video and you'd like to see some more Necron content on the channel, feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics, I will be trying to keep these unit reviews coming over the next few months. If you are enjoying regularly and you'd like to help support the videos and keep them coming, then I do have a link to the Allspets Tactics Patreon page down in the video description below. The Patreons are what allow me to keep on making videos quite so regularly, and there are a few advantages to being one as well. You get to see certain new videos early, help vote on what sort of things come next on the channel, and there's also the regular prize draws with the chance to win some big model kits. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support the channel, then the link is in the video description below. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.